patients. And one of the challenges we've had clinically uh, has been discovering a, a sort of a normative um, piece of information uh, around the, the interpretation of MRI scans and CT scans when we have patients in the pain clinic or elsewhere who have headache and may have a slightly abnormal possible Chiari. We're not really sure what's there. Uh, so I was very pleased to see uh, that Dr. Kobe had agreed to speak this year as a uh, neuroradiologist to bring some light to the issue of imaging in this. Okay, thank you very, very much. I really appreciate the invitation here. And I'm very impressed. Uh, ILC has a wonderful turnout today. I'm in the unfortunate position of speaking at nap time following two brilliant neurosurgeons. So um, we'll try to make up for lost time. The purpose of imaging is to confirm or support clinical diagnoses, the patient's symptoms and the history they give for those symptoms is the critical point in medical diagnosis. Uh, imaging can help confirm or make the diagnoses more certain. And once diagnoses are made, sometimes it's the extent or degree of abnormalities that imaging will help with. For someone who's failed conservative therapy and has neurological symptoms, prior to referral to neurosurgeon, it's reasonable to get several studies. An upright MRI of the neck bending forward in middle position, neutral, and bending back. Computed tomography of cervical spine, turning the head far to the right, far to the left, and hopefully bending forward. An MRI of lumbar spine and an MRI of brain. A uh, sample prescription pad or prescription might be for an open MRI and flexion extension and for cervical spine and far rotation. And it's to evaluate pain and instability. There's three metrics that are typically used for the craniocervical junction. That's skull base and the first two segments of the neck. First is a clival axial angle. We draw it from The skull base, sitting here is a hole through which nerves pass, the brain stem, and it's called the big hole of foramen magnum. And this is the odontoid in C2, it's the second cervical vertebral body, it's unique. And this angulation is a function, oh, excuse me. Serves me right. It's a function of the angulation or how much the brainstem may be draped across the bony structures. The second metric is Grab Oak's measurement, and it's taken from the front part of that big hole to the bottom back of C2, and a perpendicular is drawn. It's a general indication of how much soft tissue and bone is projecting backwards upon the brain stem. Harris measurements are derived from the trauma literature, and they're suggestive of ligamentous disruption. Anything greater than 1.2 centimeters or 12 millimeters suggests the ligaments are no longer intact. Uh, open MRI is a useful tool. Uh, I actually don't have it. It's referred elsewhere. But it's uh, got a number of advantages to check the spine in excursions. MRI is good for looking at soft tissue or soft tissue relation to bone. Part of the problem with open MRI is it takes longer to perform. And it's a stress position having someone bend forward for six minutes and bend back for six minutes to have the exam done. This is a 40-year-old who has had a number of examinations, and she was called normal, but she's really pretty disabled. And between, this is, let's see if I can do this. This is a neutral position. The only thing is that this is the C5, C6. There's seven vertebral bodies. 
in the cervical spine. Small bulge, but it doesn't really indent the cord much. When she bends forward, there's 29 degrees angulation from neutral to this flexion. And when she bends backwards, she has a disc bulge and the cord is, flat, is squashed or pressed upon. <coughs> Cervical spine CT, whereas the MRI uses radio waves or radio energy in a magnetic field, this is a fancy version of an x-ray machine and I'm looking to see how much is blocked. This person was turning her head as far as she could to the right. And I'll point out, this is the part of the skull base. This is a piece of that ring of C1. And this is C2 with the finger pointing up at the odontoid. And I'm measuring from the middle front to back of each of these vertebral bodies for the amount of rotation. And this person hidden to you is turned 48 degrees, and at the next level, this is C2, it's five degrees. So she's got 43 degrees rotation. 37 degrees is described as the upper limit of normal, and beyond there, it's abnormal. If someone's got a rotation above 41, I consider it significantly abnormal. Dr. Henderson likes 43 or 44 degrees. As opposed to a magic number where it's gonna be bending nerves, kinking blood vessels. It's a correlate to the degree of ligamentous laxity and the fact that the bones are wiggling themselves apart and whatever support they have is from overworked muscles. Another person bending her head forward, aside from having soft tissue pushing on her brain stem, the spine is sliding forward. And that also implies segmental instability. Lumbar spine, we are looking for problems beyond the, the uh, for problems other than a tethered cord. Tethered, a cult tethered cord, as we see in people with Ehlers-Danlos, is almost always hidden. We don't have any abnormality at all. One of the problems that I've seen is people will be sent to their imager for rule out tethered cord syndrome, and the answer comes back, no tethered cord. Well, it's not an imaging diagnosis. It's rather a clinical diagnosis with, your, with urodynamics as an adjunct. Um, we were talking about lipomas and low cord. This person's spinal cord is to the L1 level. Here's a little piece of fat and a cord that's pulled down to the L5 level. And earlier we spoke about fatty phylum or fatty infiltration of the phylum. This phylum is at the L2 level, but it's thickened with fat. I consider anybody who's symptomatic with a fatty phylum to have a tethered cord. That's somewhat controversial at this point, uh, but I think it's correct. I don't recall any of the patients, though, with Ehlers-Danlos having either an obvious tethered cord or infiltration of the phylum terminale. So it's what else might be there. This is a person who had an incomplete closure problem of the, spinal, of the spine. It's a first trimester problem. What we're seeing is this is the spine. This is the spinal cord, which is kind of thin. And this is a piece of fat. And a little piece of this, the nerve tissue is extending out into the skin. This is that little piece of fat, the white dot. And this is a CT with the bones open at that level. This is not what I expect to see in somebody with Ehlers-Danlos. But it's another problem that can cause the tethered cord syndrome. Other reasons for doing the MRI include degenerative changes, spinal stenosis, which is narrowing, or disc herniation. This person has four normal levels and one abnormal level with disc signal change and height loss. And we have a piece of disc material pushing on some of the nerve roots display distorting the contents of the spinal canal. 
Uh, MRI of brain is performed both to confirm suspected problems and to exclude other issues. This individual was uh, longstanding among a number of other issues, has a small posterior fossa. Those cerebellar tonsils project below that big hole. And in his case, he also had fluid within his spinal cord. It's called a syrinx. This person, while she had weakness and fatigue, has these funny little white spots. This person had multiple sclerosis, which is probably an immune or a reactive condition that attacks the coverings of the nerves or the conduction mechanism, and it ultimately causes failure of the nervous system. Um, that's really about all I've pulled together for you. Um, I can entertain questions, and thank you very much for your kind attention. that it's dynamic and moves. There's certainly a problem because of the manufacture, because of the space. There's going to be a problem with graininess, with lack of soft tissue contrast, and just for the patients to be able to hold still, it's hard. Um, in terms of a normal population, I don't expect to see a normal population being imaged, whether it's for spinal stenosis or a disc herniation or to check and see if someone with multiple sclerosis or infection also has a cord lesion. Uh, they don't always get their studies and excursions. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, one more. Oh. One more question yeah. approach. Thank you for waiting. Uh, I want to ask an awkward question. And I suspect that there are a number of people in the audience here who have gone to states and had up by MRIs. And they brought them back here to Canada. They've been told in the states that they've got problems that are bad. And when they get back here and they consult their own experts here, they're told there's nothing wrong. How come there's such discrepancy of opinion with regard to these pictures, which, from what you've shown us, seem to be pretty uh, self explanatory? You're finding that radiologists have the same problem that's extending across all of the medical fields, a lack of knowledge and a lack of an open mind. Um, most of the patients that end up coming to Dr. Henderson bring a shopping bag full of discs and films that have all been read as normal over and over and over. And really, by the time the first or second one is done, there's been a problem that's been misinterpreted. And part of the problem is that the imagers are not recognizing problems that are there, and perhaps if they are, they're not applying proper metrics or proper criteria. And it's like the problem with the occult tethered cord. Occult tethered cord from an imaging implies you wouldn't be seeing it. It doesn't mean that there's not stress, but for an imager to call it normal, no tethered cord, it's going to take a generation to change people's thoughts. And I would say that that's more the rule than the exception to have images that are abnormal in a symptomatic patient and are ignored or discounted. Thank you for your honest answer.